to talk about this morning is the joy of servanthood. Um, one of the things I used to love to do as a youth pastor, which I did for nine years, was take the juniors and seniors in high school every year on a back-to-school trip. Now, this was not a missions trip, and other youth pastors would look down their nose at me because I didn't do a missions trip. I'm like, our church is a mission. We're going to serve in our city. This is what we're doing. I have no problem with mission trips abroad and stuff, but, you know, for us at that time. And so what we did was we did these trips just to build camaraderie, friendship, before the school year started because um, I knew that being a teen is tough and they need friends and this just solidified and so we would uh, the first trip we did was Panama City Beach Florida um, we went there and I would tell these hotel owners what we're doing and they'd be like oh just here you can use it uh, one year we went to Daytona Beach we got uh, 18th floor of the Hilton for $40 a night Oceanside because they knew what we were wanting to do and it wasn't necessarily peak season for them uh, one year we, we camped for a week in Yellowstone. That was a big mistake on my part. <laughs> it was summertime, but up in the mountains, it got down to 30 at night, and we were dressed for summer. But uh, anyways, we migrated to the area hotel slowly after our tents collapsed. And uh, um, then another one, though, we did was New York City. We did a week in New York City. First time I ever went there, and I was driving a 15-passenger van in Times Square. Awesome. Okay, it was, it was Tracy was my navigator. Um, but we ended up going to church service. Um, we, we went to church regardless, even though we were out there. And we went to the Brooklyn Tabernacle for church. And it happened to be the Sunday that the choir was ministering. And James Simbola, the pastor of this church, if you don't know, who, who doesn't know what the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir is all about? Anybody? Okay, just Google it, YouTube it. Phenomenal choir. A lot of the contemporary Christian music artists that we had from the, that came into the 90s and even 2000s came out of the Brooklyn Tabernacle. It's a 300-person choir that they, they renovated an opera house for the Brooklyn Tabernacle. Their logo, everything's mixed into the plaster work. And um, the, so you're in a, if you've ever been in the uh, Widener Center, you're up steep like that. That's how the church sits, but just as high the other way as the choir. And so you're facing each other. And, uh, but James Simbola, he did a message on finding rest doing the work of God. Okay, and I thought that was an interesting message because a lot of times in churches, in Christianity, you hear of burnout. I serve here, I do nursery, I do this, I do that. And there's burnout that happens. And James came at it from a different perspective saying, when you truly find what you love to do in serving, you find rest in it. Okay, and I wanted to just kind of run with this theme today because Radiant Fellowship has always been a smaller church, okay? Um, a church that has um, always met here. It's, it, it started in a home years ago, but it moved here. We ended up buying this building. Actually, we're buying it from the bank eventually, you know, <laughs> the loan. And, uh, but we're, we're doing well with that. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that um, our thing has always been to do serving, to serve in the neighborhood, to serve the community. Uh, back when... Uh, when I first moved up here, Strawberry Fest was going on and still is, but they asked us, hey, would you be willing to do something uh, for Strawberry Fest? So we did. We stepped in. We got inflatables and we just, we never sold anything. We just didn't feel like that was right for us. We didn't want to set up and sell cotton candy or hot dogs or anything. So we just set up inflatables and the, the people got to know Radiant as the church that serves and don't, we don't ask for anything back. So I want to talk about that this morning because... Um, Serving one another is central to scripture. If you've ever read, and I hope you have, the story of Jesus, you would learn very quickly serving was his thing. You see, Matthew 23, 11 through 12 says, The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He was talking about a lifestyle where you live to help others. You're always looking for ways to serve. I was going to put on the screen uh, a picture of my Royal Ranger leader from growing up, and uh, I was going to, but then the snow came, and honestly, I just plain forgot. But here's a guy, and then I was going to put another picture up of a lady from my church that I grew up at. Her name was Grandma Ernst. Every church has a grandma something, okay? Grandma last name. And Grandma Ernst, she served many years in one of the spotlight ministries that people clamor for. 
In fact, she served there. I remember asking her before I left that church to take my first youth pastorate. I said, Grandma Ernst, how many years have you served in this capacity? She goes, well, this year's 39. 39 years. And that spotlight ministry that she served in day in and day every week, nursery. <laughs> okay? Now, if you ask somebody, I filled in for nursery once before I left that church. I didn't know about pull-ups. And, and I didn't know much about diaper changes, but I learned very quickly with pull-ups, when a kid loads his diaper, you don't slide them down, okay? Because that makes even more of a mess than anything. There's little things you can just rip the sides and you're good. Now I know. Father, three kids later, I am a genius on poo and all things diapers. <laughs> but 39 years, Grandma Ernst served as the nursery worker. My Royal Ranger leader, Emil Hines, Bill would know him, and I was going to throw some pictures. I'll put them up on the Facebook page later today. Emil, I bumped into at my mom's funeral. And Emil is now pushing 90. But Emil, I remember, was... I looked at some of the pictures that my dad gave me that I developed. That um, They were back from the 70s. And Emil was the Royal Ranger leader at Bethel Tabernacle Assembly of God. Now, does that name sound churchy or what? <laughs> Bethel Tabernacle Assembly of God. Um, and so... Emil was there, and this guy, there were times that my dad couldn't take us because he worked a part-time job, so Emil would pick us up in the coolest vintage Dodge Charger, which was only probably a couple years old back in those days, but we'd stop at George Webb, he'd grab his coffee, then we'd go to church, and I remember this, and when I saw him at my mom's funeral, I go, Emil, how many years were you the Royal Ranger leader at, at, uh, at Bethel, now Poplar Creek? He goes, well, let me take a thing, let me think here. He said, and this was just last year that I talked last October. He goes, I just hung it up three years ago. What? I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yeah, I had lessened my capacity in what I did, but I would sit in there and I'd read the devotion to the kids and still do the attendance. But back then he was all into the ropes and everything. I mean, he was Mr. Ranger. And, and I'm like, so you've been doing this for like 40 years. He goes, yeah, it sounds about right. I'm like, Wow. There are lessons to be learned here regarding Christianity and serving. And a lot of us, we do serving. And some of us say, well, I could never serve for 40 years. And I say, well, that's because you're only 30. Uh, so <laughs> just stick around for a while. We could use you. All right? The, and, and it becomes a part of who you are. When you start serving, when we start serving as a church, it's in our DNA to serve. It's part of who we are it's all it, it seems foreign not to do a back to school rally it seems foreign not to do the rock it seems foreign when we walk around and we hear that kids can't don't have all the supplies they need for school it's foreign for us to, to, to say we're not going to do anything this year when in fact we can set up an inflatable a grill collect school supplies and no questions asked neighbors can come and take what they need and go their way it's serving that's what we're called to do You've developed, and we've developed an attitude of serving. Not living to get, but living to give. And on and on it goes. How is that for us on an individual basis? Okay, that's what I want to look at this morning. I'm going to meddle a little bit just in society as a, as a whole. This is the reason a lot of people are unhappy. I am a firm believer in this. They're only focused on themselves, my dreams, my goals, my problems, my family, that they forget that what they're supposed to do, and that is to serve, to go out and make a difference. And that's going to limit you. You're created to give, and God puts people in our path on purpose so we can be a blessing to them. How many times have you or I have been in a church service or a conference or something, and they illustrate the serving concept by what Jesus did for his disciples, and what was that? The washing of the disciples' feet. Now, that's a great illustration, and we've seen people do it. Maybe you've seen people do that as to drive a point. It's getting down and actually washing a person's feet isn't the main point, okay? I'm not going to ever have Ben come up here, and I'm not going to scrub your feet, okay? It's just not what I'm going to do. <laughs> what he's driving the point of, what Jesus was driving the point of, is saying we need to serve each other. People, the disciples were going crazy saying, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? Peter, I believe it was Peter that said, no, you can't wash my feet. You're, you're, you're Jesus. And he goes, this is what we do. And ultimately, Peter said, well, then here's all of you. Watch me, you know. 
And we need to understand, I need the reminder that we are here to serve. And by Jesus doing that, he was illustrating the point, we serve each other. We need to serve each other. Every morning we should ask, God, show me an assignment today. Help me to see the people that you want me to be good to. It, a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, I saw Tim Hawkins in concert at the Widener Center for the Performing Arts. And he's a Christian comedian. And what I love about Tim Hawkins is this. There's Christian comedians. There's a lot of funny Christian comedians, okay? But if you know me, you would understand why I like Tim Hawkins. Here's the Christian line between Christian and secular. Tim Hawkins goes, right here, and comes back around again. He gets that close on. I'm like, this is awesome. That's part of it. That's who I am. And he started at his, his riff on homeschoolers. Phenomenal. And at one point, he goes, all the homeschoolers are getting mad. We got to leave. The mom's like, okay, kids, grab your rope. And they walk in. You know. <laughs> it was just amazing. But, but what he said about comedy is true about serving. He goes, anybody can do this. Anybody can do this. All you got to do is look around and find out and, 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 and study things. Serving is the same thing. All you got to do is look around. This morning, uh, over the past few Sundays, I've gotten into a groove. I, I have the computer set, everything's ready to go for Sunday mornings. And chances are, if you drove by the Rose Garden at 6.30 in the morning, you would find me in my own um, booth by myself enjoying a meal. Now, people that, this is what's funny, people that, are, that may be single or, or anything like, you know, like that, they, they, they hear somebody eating by themselves and they're like, oh, that's so sad. It's glorious. <laughs> it's phenomenal. <laughs> Okay, you went to the movie by yourself? How sad. No, it was the best day ever. <laughs> it was the best. Nobody wanting popcorn. Nobody, it was just all me and my soda. Don't judge me, you know? And so there I am, and I'm looking over my sermon notes and everything. But as, I, as I'm getting ready to, to check out, the, the waitress, she was talking about how her kid is in fourth grade and how he needs a Chromebook or a laptop, and then he's going to have to print off schoolwork and everything. And it, it, as Tim Hawkins said, you don't have to look hard. This was the case with serving. I didn't have to look very hard. You just got to be in tune with what God's doing, what God's placed in your path. And instantly my mind went to, this lady needs a laptop. This lady needs a Chromebook. And she was talking about how she has to put in extra hours, how she doesn't know how tight things are going to be. And I'm thinking, you know, for some people, a Chromebook, 200 bucks, write a check, here you go. And there were people in that restaurant that could have easily done that. Here's a tip. There you go. But for me, guess what my wheels are going to be doing all day today? It's going to be sitting down saying, where can I get a Chromebook? Where can I get a computer? Where can I get an e-printer? 50 bucks. Okay, where can I get one of these? And it would be nice maybe Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday, walk in and be like, here you go. There's no need to stress out. You're a single mom. You're doing awesome. You're working. Just here you go. No strings attached. We don't have to look far to serve. That's how we got the rock going. You drive by, oh, stay away from that place. That's, that's, that's the transient living. Okay, well, that's where I need to be, actually. When we moved up to Wapaka, and this church went through a very tough transition a year after I got here, I sent out a letter to all the bartenders and the owner of the, the, the strip club down on the other side of town. And I said, I'm Bob. My, I'm the pastor at Radiant Fellowship. I come from Milwaukee. Uh, I don't know the area, I don't know you, but the fact that you have chosen to be a business owner of a bar, a tavern, strip club, may become, may, may make it difficult to go to church. I get that. But I just want to let you know that I'm aware that you still have spiritual needs, and if you ever need anything, we're here for you. Left it at that. And within a year, it took a year, but a year later, the owner of that, uh, of the club, one of the owners, called me and said, my son has done something very, very bad. I need someone to talk to, and I've kept your letter in the top drawer of my desk at work. We chatted, and that was it. That was it for a long time. Fast forward to about January 2013, 2012, and in comes the owner of that place walking through the door. About a year later, this person sold off their part of the club, and started attending regularly here at Radiant Fellowship. Since then, they've moved and everything. But that's how serving works. Stay away from that area. Okay, that's where I need to go then, actually. But there's like five other Bible studies going on over here. No, I, I'm, 
I grew up in the church. I don't need another Bible study right now. I need to go serve. You know, I love Bible study. I love sitting down to a Bible. I love sitting down in a coffee shop, if we had one, and, um, and uh, sitting down and just yapping with people about theology. I call that recreational theology, where we don't get offended about things, but let's talk about it. What, what do you believe about that? What, what is the purpose? of that's, that's what gets me jazzed. You see, when you serve others, you're serving God. Matthew 25, 40 says, The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. In Matthew 10, 42, And if anyone gives you even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. The heartbeat of Christianity is to serve. Bible studies are great. We need them. Church services are awesome. We need to be together. But what are we doing when we're not here? The Apostle Paul puts a lot of octane in the thought that being part of a church is a phenomenal thing because we serve each other, we help each other, we're there for each other. That's the part, that's the perk of being a part of a church. We put on a couple of roofs for people in the church. They have one lady had a straight ranch and she was needing to spend thousands on a new roof and we came along, we said, no, no, you don't need to do that. Just order the stuff. A group of us from the church will put the roof on. And we did. This happens over and over again within this church, this body of believers. And it saddens me when, I, when, my, like, when my mom was still around, she had a friend that needed help moving. This person called their church, and the, per, the church called them back and said, no, we can't help you because we, we, we would then run into an insurance issue if somebody got hurt. And, and in my mind, my, my, my churchy side, my side that's been around the block, I just wanted to tell this lady, get out of that church. You need to leave that church. Because this is a huge, a huge red flag for how they view outreach. Or something needs to change. We need to just say, I, I don't really care what insurance is going to think. We need to help this person move. Or, okay, as a non-sanctioned church event, we are going to help this lady move, you know, that sort of thing. But outreach is the heartbeat of God in the New Testament. Now, here's the key. Don't look for people to pay you back. If something comes about where we can provide this lady with a netbook, wow, I dated myself there, or a Chromebook, <laughs> or something along those lines, or just a nice used laptop, we don't say, okay, feel free to use it, and just feel free to pay it back whenever you can. It's all good. No, don't expect payback. We don't expect payback for the people we serve at The Rock, and we're only a week or two away from actually providing van services now to get those people here for church. Charlie's done a great job at reconditioning the van, putting it back to the way it was from being a, a mail delivery van, and soon we'll be able to start offering that service. We don't look for payback, but we serve others, and as one person said, the applause is in heaven. We receive our applause from heaven. Almighty God sees our sacrifice, and we don't need people cheering us on. He sees what we're doing. Ministry can be a very, very thankless job. Not just talking as a pastor, but just when we serve. But God always notices what we do. We were created to make somebody else's life better. Somebody needs what we have. Some people just need a smile. Some people that are, that are ringing us up at Pick and Save, someone ringing us up at McDonald's, they may be so flustered. James and I went there the other night. We were in search for ice cream. We were in hot pursuit. <laughs> DQ closed because of the storm. Other places closed of the storm. And we went to McDonald's. This lady goes, there's only three of us, and I don't know why we're so busy tonight. It goes, because you're the only one open in town tonight. She goes, oh, and I go, you're doing an awesome job. She forgot who I was, but I coached her kid in soccer a couple of years ago. And you could just see, like, I said, do you have a tip jar? You should have a tip jar out. Boss won't let us. Just go ahead, put one out. You know, it was just one of these things. But, you know, just to build somebody up with a smile is serving somebody. One time, Jesus and his disciples traveled a great distance to the city of Samaria. You know the story. He sent the disciples to get food. He met a lady at the well. They had a conversation. He basically read her mail and said, go in forgiveness. You're fine. And when the disciples came back, though, they saw that he wasn't hungry anymore. This is interesting. We hang out on the woman part at the well, 
Now she had multiple husbands and everything. But we don't necessarily pay attention to this part. The disciples came back and Jesus said, I'm not hungry. Can you imagine the disciples? Really? Really? It's not like we just got in a car and went and got some food. We had to walk to get you some food. If you ever had to go get somebody food, you know how thankful they are. I remember one time our youth pastor, Carlo Grissetta, and I hope you're watching. Um, <laughs> he, uh, he gave my friend Adrian Chapin and I and, and his brother Todd 25 bucks to go get him some food. And we came back, I'll never forget it, we came back with like six pairs of fuzzy dice and some other things and a couple, uh, couple of uh, candy bars. And he's like, are you serious? And we were working on some church van. I was like, we need a fuzzy dice for the church van. It was, it's awesome, you know. And, and so you can imagine the letdown here. They come back to Jesus, and they're like, he, he's fed. He, he ate already. They're like, What's going on here? They wondered who fed him. But in John 4, 33 through 34, it says, Then his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? Jesus said, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He was essentially saying, I get fed by doing what God asks me to do. My nourishment comes from helping people. My food, my strength, my peace, my joy, my satisfaction, it comes when I serve. Did James Simbola hit on a point where he said, I find my rest in doing the work of the Lord? Absolutely. When you find your groove in what you enjoy doing to serve, there's nothing else like it. There's nothing else like that at all. It was refreshed. He was refreshed. Why is that? Because when you do the will of the Father, it doesn't drain you. It replenishes you. Do you ever get tired of being a pastor, Pastor Bob? There are some Sundays where it's like, I think I would like to try to sleep in on the today. <laughs> you know, sounding a little British. I'd like to sleep in today. <laughs> but you can't. But, and, and honestly, that's the human side of being a pastor. That's the job. You have a full-time job. This is my full-time gig. This is what I do. You will have those days. But as a whole, there will be moments where it's like, oh, no, another Wednesday with the Royal Rangers. 20 boys cooped up. They've been in school all day. They get a couple hour breather. Now they're going to be cooped up in here again. But I tell you what, it's actually pretty fun. You come in. You do your thing. The kids love it. And... Some of these kids, half the kids that are in the Royal Ranger group this year, they've never even built a model rocket. And when you get to apply life lessons to building model rockets, it's a phenomenal thing. We find work. We realize it replenishes you. Many of us today in here, we serve. We volunteer here at Radiant Fellowship or other places. We find a refreshing, refreshing in that. Refre re how would you say it? Freshness in that. We're able to renew our, our, our life. Maybe we, some of us serve in our community. You should be run down, but when you serve others, God recharges you. He re-energizes you. I like this saying. It says, now if, you've never have an, now, if you never have any energy, no joy, no strength, no reason, one reason, not maybe because you're not doing anything for anybody else, let me read that again. Now, if you never have any energy, no joy, no strength, one reason, not maybe because you're not doing anything for anybody else, you've got to get your mind off of yourself. Go to the senior center. Cheer on somebody. Bake your neighbor a cake. Coach Little League. Do something to get your mind, your eyes off of yourself. Proverbs 12.25 says anxiety, that is a huge word lately in social media. Anxiety. I'm dealing with anxiety over and over. I'm not downplaying it. That's a real thing. But anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Why? How can I serve if I'm feeling down? How can I serve if I'm dealing with anxiety? Can you afford a cup of coffee and call a friend? Can you just call a friend and encourage them? We live in 2019. Can you just do a private message to them? Jump on Facebook, send them a message, say, hey, just thinking of you today. I hope you're doing well. I'm convinced more marriages would last if we did this, if we served each other. I'm quite convinced of that. Our relationship with our kids would be stronger if we actually served them and saying, go do the dishes, go do that, go do this. No, I'm going to take you out today just because. I'm going to take you to the movie. 
New How to Train Your Dragons Elf. What kid wouldn't love to see that? <laughs> it's all of these things that we can do in our own relationships. So let me ask you, who are you serving? Who are you lifting up? Who are you being good to? We have to be on the lookout for ways to serve. If we call ourselves a Christian and we're not serving in some capacity, it's kind of counter to what Jesus was do, talking about in the New Testament. Tony Campolo, one of my favorite authors, speakers, he wrote a book called Red Letter Christianity. You need to read it. <laughs> There's a lot of theological takes on Tony and the whole red letter the theology, but just read the book for what it is. He examines just the red letters of Jesus in this book, and it will change your life. One other book. I can't, I can't, I don't have time to serve or anything like this. Read this other book by Mike Iaconelli called Messy Spirituality. Even Brennan Manning quoted this guy in his books. Mike Iaconelli was a youth pastor guru with Zondervan Publishers, and he wrote this book called Messy Spirituality, and he talked about how when we serve, we aren't going to always be with people that make us comfortable or uh, in these different ways. But boy, you've come to just love them. One of the highlights when we pull up to serve with the rock down at the hotel is when Nolan's waiting at the door. <laughs> and he greets you and he helps you set up and all of these things. Not somebody I would have dreamed I would be hanging out with a couple years ago. But he speaks life into you and he's so appreciative of what you do. So we have to look for ways to serve. Are we open to that? Are we willing to say, okay, the church provides opportunities. What ways can I serve? I don't know where to begin in the community. I don't know where to begin in the church. Well, just let me know if you want to serve in the church. I could set you up with a few things. <laughs> that's, that's not a problem. I wear a lot of different hats. If computer's your thing, I got a website you can maintain. I do that currently. The fact is, is all of the artwork all of the web stuff, all of the podcasting, the mastered parts of it that go up on the web, that all, I, do, I take care of all of that stuff. And I'm okay with it. But if you need, if, if web stuff's your thing, Rick does the live streaming and, and records the podcasts, but we certainly can put you in and get you going on those sort of things. The Rock, we can do that. Kids ministry. Uh-oh, heard a needle drop on that one. <laughs> we could get you plugged in with kids ministry. I always, I always get a, a, a rise out of people that say, we had, I'm so fried from all the kids, and how many did you have? Eight. Really? <laughs> My kids' ministry in, in Milwaukee, when I, was, when I first started there as a youth pastor, not only did you have youth ministry, but you had kids, and then there was 25 kids and maybe one other helper. It was kind of like, you know, the big deal. But when you do it right, it becomes a very positive thing. We have... We have um, uh, other places you can serve within the church, grounds and um, shoveling, all of that sort of stuff that we can get you plugged into. If, if communications is your thing, we could use somebody to handle all of the Facebook stuff. And not like, and, and Ben does our uh, Instagram, and you know, just to do all of those sort of things. We have Radiant Radio, which is going to be getting new life back into it in the next couple of weeks. And literally, you go to our website, you'll see Radiant Radio on the lower left, and it's an online radio station we have that plays like the obscure but bigger Christian hits that from the blues eras and all of that stuff that's on there. We have teachings on there and everything. Maybe that's your thing. There's always a place to serve. And when we serve, it brings so much joy. Let's have the worship team come back up. I want to read these words from one of my pastors that I found in a letter when I was shuffling through all of my mom's stuff. It says, Many of you have been faithful, given, served, volunteered. Be encouraged today. God sees every act of kindness. Nothing goes unnoticed. You will be rewarded. Remember when you do not, remember when you do what God asks you to do, you're being fed. You're getting stronger, refreshed, re-energized. So be on the lookout for ways that you can be good to people. If you'll develop this lifestyle of serving, God says you will be great in the kingdom. Isn't that something? We forget about that sometimes as Christians, that when we serve, 
we're the hands and feet of Jesus. These people down at the rock, they look forward to a good meal. This lady at the restaurant, she may or may not, we may be able to help her, I don't know. But there's so many other opportunities. And so I would just say, be open to how God wants you to serve. And if you don't know where to serve, jump in. I am going to help in nursery today. Okay, let's try it. Let's see where it goes. <laughs> a couple of things we need to do on the church side. We need to run a background and all that. No big deal. But if it's your thing in two, three weeks, you're like, no, no, I have aged 20 years in the last three weeks. It's not my thing. Fine, at least you tried it. <laughs> and that's okay. We'll get you plugged in somewhere else. But serving, when you serve, it lights you up. I grew up in the area where churches would do the big shebang explosion outreach event where you'd bring in a multi-thousand dollar speaker and all of that stuff. And it just sort of went away because they weren't seeing the heat of fruit from it. Churches weren't growing from them. Imagine that. And, you know, and, and all of these things. And so they kind of got discouraged. But my thought has always been when we did Candy Carnival um, in October, it's, my thought has always been even if nobody comes to our church from it, Sometimes I wonder if we need to do these events for us and not for them. That we grow from them. And we realize that there's an ongoing need in our community. So something to think about. 